Well, it's so great to be here with all of you today. Thank you so much for being here. Franklin and Mac are, are kind of familiar faces around KTV. So, Bob, we'll start with you since you're uh, our guest. And, and I'd like to begin first just by getting your thoughts on the business community here in Arkansas, its relative strengths. I is this a good place, in your opinion, to invest? Well, I'm invested with these two guys, so. <laughs> and we're I, glad of it. I guess, Absolutely. I guess that's sort of uh, part of the answer. I mean, I, I'm uh, not totally familiar with uh, Arkansas or Little Rock, but uh, what I do know is that uh, Arkansas has turned out some strong business leaders in, in, in Mac McClarity. There's a gentleman I met when I was down here for the uh, Jefferson Jackson dinner, mm -hmm. uh, Jerry Jones of Axiom, mm -hmm. uh, who's another business leader, and obviously, uh, President Clinton, you can put him in that category. <laughs> he brought a balanced budget to the country, yeah. a surplus, created jobs, and yeah. created a lot of jobs. So I think, and then I had a, a meeting uh, last night mm -hmm. with some uh, African-American business leaders, uh, uh, the CEO of uh, Southern Bank, I think it's Southern, Southern Bank. Bank Corp. Yeah, right. Southern Bank Corp. And uh, they're very positive about the uh, business opportunity, the business future in, in Low Rock. And uh, so I'm anxious to share what thoughts I have uh, with the chamber. Great. You, you have interest in, in banking, in private equity, in real estate, a host of other areas. What was it that drew you to the auto industry? Uh, that was very simple. It was Mac McClarity. <laughs> Thank you. I, I tell people, I didn't know much about cars. I mean, I, I, I know how to drive them. That way I was good at that. <laughs> or riding the back of them. I'm, that's another one. But Mac and I have been friends uh, ever since uh, we've known uh, President Clinton. Mm. And, and Secretary Clinton. Mm -hmm. And when Mac came to me and said, Bob, I'd like to talk to you about a business my family's been in for uh, almost three generations. And I think you would add value to it, not just the capital, but in terms of the commitment of the OEMs, the manufacturers, to increase minority ownership of dealerships. And so to me, that would just sort of was completely consistent with my philosophy of how African-American businessmen can come together with majority business leaders and create value and opportunity uh, and demonstrate to this country, and in this case to where we're headquartered here in Little Rock, uh, that uh, there's an opportunity for people working together to create a, a better economy for the United States. Mac, it was actually the late Ron Brown who introduced exactly. the two of you yep, uh, in exactly. 1992. You proposed this partnership. We did. Why did you want to be in business with Bob? Well, we had had the, the good fortune to be partnered with Steve Landers, who's a longtime good friend. Now Jim Press has been very engaged in our efforts. Of course, Franklin has really helped build the, the company and lead it and really develop the culture. So it's pretty special, and Franklin and his brother Mark are fourth generations in the automobile business, mm -hmm. so we're standing on some, some pretty strong shoulders. But Bob was a natural. We had worked together on a number of things, and it was a way for us to grow our business, but also in a unique way, as Bob just pointed out. Uh, and we've tried to stay very true to, to the original vision we've had. Franklin's been a key, key part of that, of the glue that's really made it work, but I think we've really developed great minority leaders within our company, but most importantly, have we feel, built uh, the premier minority-owned automotive group in the country, number one for the last several years, uh, but always with an emphasis on serving our customers. Customers, people, relationships, that's, that's the key to the business. You, you've all been in business now together for, for about a decade. RML Automotive, $1.4 billion in revenues last year. Franklin, it, it seems like the car business is a pretty good business to be a part of. It's been a good time to be in the car business, Chris. Um, we've weathered some storms. There was a major contraction shortly after we started the partnership with Bob, and that, you know, that required very hands-on and, and skilled management, some tough decisions. It also provided some unique opportunities for some value purchases where we were able to really go and breathe life into dealerships that were struggling with the contracting new car sales. But the last several years have been just the opposite. It's been an excellent rebound, 16 million plus new car sales in the United States. It's been a good time to be in the automotive business. And Chris, the PS on uh, the relationship, partnership with Bob. Bob's a builder. He's an entrepreneur. Of course, he built BET. But he's also had a, a great run at it in his hotel business with relationships with Marriott. So this is a natural follow on, build out, if you will, of some of the partnerships Bob's had, and it's been a great partnership. He's been a great partner. You have 25 or so dealerships right now, plus three Harley Davidson outlets. Are you looking for opportunities to grow the business? Is bigger, better right now? Well, I, I think if you look at the automotive industry, and I keep coming back to something uh, Max said to me uh, when we were talking about this business, he said that. Uh, as long as, Bob, you and I are going to be around, automobiles are going to be the largest form of mass transportation in this country. 
And when you look at that and you recognize that uh, the opportunity to build out dealerships and provide the service to people who buy uh, cars, and you recognize that the technology is changing the way people are, are purchasing cars, you look at that and say, this is an industry that will grow with technological shifts and demographic shifts. Uh, and so we, we look at this market as a place to be involved in, and I particularly look at it because I want to save the number of minority dealerships that exist today and by increasing opportunities for minorities. And, and we make it an effort to bring in as many minorities as we can into our management uh, structure and, and management, managerial participation in our ownership. So if we can do that, grow our business, do something positive for, uh, for minorities, and develop a, a, an industry, an opportunity that can grow with the industry, whether you're driving cars without uh, drivers <laughs> or, or whether it's uh, you know, people coming in saying, show me the car packs. Yeah. We want to be a part of that new way of, of purchasing automobiles. And, and can you do that here in Arkansas? Are there buying opportunities oh, in yeah. Arkansas I think, right frankly, now? Frankly, you speak to kind of the cutting edge changes in the industry. Sure, absolutely. Well, Chris, we're we're always looking for opportunities to grow strategically. Uh, we just expanded uh, in Northwest Arkansas about a year ago with a very large Dodge Chrysler Jeep uh, facility that we we opened there. Ford uh, just opened a new facility uh, just south of, of Dallas there in a new Nissan dealership. So we'll look to continue to expand and in terms of the technology we've got to meet the customers where they are so whether they're on our showroom floor or, or on their smartphone mm -hmm. um, we've got to be able to engage with them where they are in the most convenient and effective way for them your, your dealerships are in eight states mostly southern states I yeah. think Kansas Missouri and, and Maryland as well is there something about this part of the country that you find particularly attractive yeah I'll, I'll uh, touch that quickly and Franklin can expand I, I think our sweet spot are the markets that we're really comfortable in that are natural to the way we conduct our our business so you've got uh, the Little Rocks the Shreveports the Huntsville Alabama's Kansas City Dallas Fort Worth area those are good solid markets in our our geographic area so that's a good fit with our culture I agree dad I think you know we're based in Little Rock we have a office in Dallas as well and so you're going to see naturally deals in the markets where you already have a presence uh, that's where we have our strongest human resources so naturally focusing on those areas is uh, is a fit for us I know that real estate values play a big role when 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 deals get done do you find real estate costs more these are, attractive these are the in two the real estate guys here, uh -huh. Bob and <laughs> You know, no, you know, obviously uh, being in business, the old saying, you know, location, location, location. <laughs> so, yeah, you've got, you've got to find the right, right real estate, not only for, uh, you know, just uh, you know, being able to reach your customers and serve your customers. You've got to also make sure you've got real estate to expand yeah. as the opportunities grow and, right. and, and you, new kind of services you want to provide to the customer. Uh, but uh, we have a, I would say, a geographic concentration. Yeah. That makes sense. I wouldn't call it a total cluster where we're sort of keeping our, our management sort of in, in constant access, either by plane or by, by car. But the fact is, there's some advantages to being very close to your customers and having your management close to your operations. And so we, we think where we are located, and particularly during the downturn in this country, this part of the country wasn't hit as bad as some of the other states. Mm -hmm. And so we weathered the, the 07, 08 transition in the economy pretty well because we were in states where uh, the opportunity for people to continue to purchase automobiles and the need for it was there. And so we, uh, I, I'd call ourselves smart, but we we're also lucky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. I know you were in Waxahachie for the opening of a dealership back in August. Oh, How important is it for you to be in the dealerships yeah. Yeah. still at this yeah. at this point in your career. I think community engagement, yeah. Bob and Deb were both uh, in Waxahachie recently as well. I think the community engagement, the engagement with our team members um, to show that there really is a personal connectivity. It's not a sterile corporate uh, situation. There's really a, a deep personal connection with the stores and the customers we're uh, fortunate to serve. I think that matters a lot, Chris, and it's a real differentiator. Yeah, and Chris, I, this is a people business. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, not only your valued associates that Bob and Franklin both have spoken to and again Franklin's done a great job building the culture but also your customers that they're, they're your most valuable asset and you've got to remember Chris people use their cars and trucks to conduct their lives to get to work to pick up their children to attend their church 
And that's what we want to be part of that community and serve that need. So that, that's really our, our focus and our philosophy, and we, we're sincere about it. Okay. In addition to the automotives, I know you two had some SBICs that, that kind of blended and intersected <laughs> yeah, well. Would you yeah. talk about that? Sure. I, I think uh, for me, I found a great partner, a gentleman named Chris Smith. We co-founded McCarty Capital Partners. It's an SBIC fund. Bob, of course, at uh, RLJ Credit Opportunities. Um, you know, those are great opportunities to do good and do well at the same time, in our view. You're providing capital, access to capital to small and mid-sized enterprises that really need it, um, and you're able to get good risk-adjusted returns for your investors. So it's been exciting for us, and uh, it's been great to have a blueprint, because Bob was ahead of us, to, <laughs> to follow. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think the one thing that I'd like the, the viewers to understand, that what makes this country work well and what can make it uh, an opportunity for everybody to participate is the fact that if a, a minority American is looking for capital and strategic relationships, uh, because of the limited amount of capital, access to capital that's found in, within the African American community, by being able to reach outside and bring in capital to help that company grow, to me is the best way to increase economic opportunity for minorities in ownership and jobs and building stable communities where minorities live. So uh, Mac and I came together for that purpose. They had a fund, a uh, investment fund. I had a company that was looking for a capital. That fund invested in uh, my company, RLJ Entertainment, a publicly traded company. Uh, so when I see the opportunities and what I think I will address with the Chamber of Commerce is I've had the great experience, uh, in addition to Mac, of having a gentleman by the name of John Malone, mm -hmm. who's one of the mm -hmm. largest uh, owners of media properties and, and cable properties in the United States, to be an investor with me in starting Black Entertainment Television. And from that early investment, BET became the largest African American company ever created. And it's still around today, obviously. So to me, what we do it's not only good for our own business and our own wealth generation and all the things that go with business and our and employees and our stakeholders, but to me, it's somewhat symbolic of what can happen if people look at how we can bring talent with capital, with vision, and then execute on an opportunity that'll benefit everybody. Mm -hmm. Well, you can see pretty, pretty clearly why it's uh, great to partner with Bob Johnson and why I'm so proud, Franklin's a fourth generation member, uh, along with his brother Mark, participating in our, our family business endeavors. So it's been pretty special and been pretty successful. We gotta work hard to keep it successful every day, and we will. <laughs> who are your heroes in business? Who, who inspires you? Well, mine's gotta be uh, John Malone. Yeah. Right. You know, John, John put the first mm -hmm. uh, half a million dollars into BET, stayed on the board of the company for 20 years, never sold a share, and I could pick up the phone and call him and get advice from him and that other people would say, wow, you can call John Malone and talk to him. <laughs> and when he would support me and I would go out to get bank financing or to get new uh, cable operators to carry my programming, the first question they'd ask me is say, who's your partner? Mm -hmm. And I'd say, John Malone. It was almost, if you could think about like the, the you know, back in the old day, the good housekeeping seal coming down on the deal. <laughs> it was like, oh, Malone, no problem, sign right here. So yeah, you got, and, and the guy was, he, he, he believed in entrepreneurs. He's a visionary. He not only supported me, he supported John Hendricks, who created Discovery Channel, mm -hmm. Ted Turner at uh, <laughs> Turner Broadcasting. Uh, so he's, he's that kind of a, of a, of a visionary and, uh, and an entrepreneur himself. And so uh, he has to be uh, my business hero. Franklin, yours might be sitting here for, well, for all we know. Well, there's no question, Chris, that, that both my father and Bob are, are, you know, really been great mentors to me. I've been fortunate to be able to work with both of them and would certainly put them in the hero category. I'd also put a couple of Arkansas bankers in Johnny Allison and George Gleason and seeing what they've built with home bank shares and Bank of the Ozarks is really remarkable. And so I've had the great benefit of working around some uh, exceptional leaders, both uh, my father and Bob, right at the top of the list. And Matt? Well, I've been very fortunate and indeed blessed. I, I would certainly start with my father that we, as I alluded to earlier, we're certainly standing on his and my grandfather's shoulders, but he was just a wonderful mentor, a colorful character, great salesman, great car, car guy. Uh, but also, uh, fortunate in Arkansas, Chris, over the years, you know, you've got deep roots here as well, but Sam Walton, I was very fortunate at a young age to work with with Sam and you can't be around that kind of iconic figure and not have him be an influence but also Bill Bowen who was 
chairman of Commercial National Bank mm -hmm. and First Commercial later that had confidence in me at an early age, and it might not have turned out so well when Bill first asked me to serve on the board. So I've been very fortunate to just have a number of people to truly look up for, not just in business acumen, but also in values and character. Okay. I'd be remiss having you here if we didn't talk a little bit of politics uh, right now. <laughs> you can, you can uh, be remiss. <laughs> <laughs> let, let, let's talk about some of the policies that, that, that President-elect Trump um, championed on the campaign trail, mm -hmm. on trade, on taxes. H how do you see them playing out and, and affecting the automotive industry? Well, I'll take a quick, uh, quick uh, initial cut. Bob and I were visiting about this morning, and Franklin's uh, very politically uh, active and engaged, serving with Governor Beebe and, and with a number of, in a number of other ways. I, I think, first of all, you do have a businessman that was elected. Obviously, Bob and Franklin and I have supported Secretary Clinton. We've had a longstanding relationship and deep friendship with the Clintons. Thought she was the best person to be president, but we only have one president at a time, so. Donald Trump was elected. We need to support him and hope for a successful administration. I think, frankly, on the uh, pro-business front, front, sensible regulation, hopefully tax reform, which you'll need some Democrats to help him on that, those will be two very good, welcomed uh, initiatives from the automobile sector and, more importantly, business uh, widely. Mm -hmm. I think trade is a concern. Uh, we are just part of this interconnected world. Certainly, we've got to have trade agreements that work better for all Americans, but that, that's a crucial area, not just in terms of commerce, but in foreign policy. Let me stop there, Bob, and turn yeah, it to you. No, uh, Chris, what I, where, I would, where I would go on this is uh, President-elect Trump famously said to African Americans, you know, what do you have to lose by mm -hmm. staying in the, in, in the Democratic Party? If I ever get a chance to talk to him, I would say the question you really should ask is, what do we have to gain by working with the Republican Party and your administration. And, and I believe there are things that as a business person, and I'm a business person, that we could find common ground. Uh, Secretary Clinton has al already said people should reach out to the new president-elect and, and seek common ground. And I think common ground means how do we find more access to capital for minority business people, Little Rock or wherever we are. I think the same thing needs to be said about job creation. Uh, wealth creation, closing the wealth gap between uh, white American families and African American families. All of these things create opportunities and I, I think if he's really serious uh, and, and I hope to find out that if he's serious about you know what is the African Americans need and what can make us uh, uh, make us believe in what the what he's saying and by extension his administration is begin to focus on those things that are the unique special interests of the African-American community. Mm -hmm. Well, when you hear uh, things like 35% tariffs on imported vehicles, mm -hmm. renegotiating NAFTA, does it make you nervous in business? I, I think it makes everyone a, a bit nervous. Uh, certainly Bill Ford's spoken about that. But what you say during an election cycle and what you really try to implement with a level head and steely-eyed realism uh, once you're governing, I think there's a difference between those two things. And I think there's been a reasonableness in a lot of his business dealings, if you look at that record in the past, and I hope he'll carry that forward in exactly the way that both Dad and Bob talked about it, with some bipartisan approach, some common ground, and really be able to get things done, refine things that need to be refined. Maybe some trade agreements fall into that category. But I think burning things down, Chris, doesn't help anybody. Having helped enact NAFTA uh, in the White House, was it distressing to you to see it uh, come under attack during the campaign and, and in a way that, that seems to have really resonated with voters, especially in the Rust Belt, who helped decide this election? Well, Chris, it's a fair question. I think Franklin really uh, framed it just right in terms of not only NAFTA, but trade agreements more broadly. Of course, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, with which President Obama has strongly advocated, looks like it's not going to pass, and that's going to create a big void of leadership in Asia just at the very time China is is, is uh, rising from an economic and, and uh, uh, leadership standpoint. Yes, I, I think you have to look at the benefits of NAFTA broadly, but you also, Chris, have to be sensitive, and it's a point that you make, to where there has been dislocation, not necessarily just trade agreements, but that's easy to have a, a poster, so to speak, of a plant moving to Mexico or another country. But what's really driving this globalization change is, is technology and the interconnectedness of the world, and that's reality. We've got to learn how to make globalization work for all of our citizens, 
That's the course correction that President Obama spoke of. I think he's right. And I think what Franklin said about Donald Trump, I think he is a deal maker and he's going to be tested with those skills. He thinks he's up to it. I hope he is. He'll have to figure out how to achieve win-win situations, very much in keeping with what Bob outlined earlier. So that's my honest feelings. Bob, you wrote about the election and you said that one of your fears is that the divide in our politics could render African Americans a declining voice in the electoral process. How so? Well, uh, it, to me, it's um, very simple. If you look at the U.S. political landscape, there are two parties, Republican and Democrat. Probably be that way for a long time. Maybe an emerging independent, but I don't think so. So if African Americans are locked into one party and they tend to vote, we tend to vote as a block. So someone is going to get 98 or 90 to 90% of our vote. If we're locked into that party, the other party is going to either ignore us or work against us. And the party where we always have the votes are going to take us for granted. That, in my mind, as a history major when I was at the Woodrow Wilson School in Princeton, that is not balance of power politics. Balance of power politics is when you say to both parties, here are the interests that we have. How would you address them? And then you vote accordingly. You can vote all the way or half the way, but you, you focus on your interests and not find yourself a pawn in a chess game. Because right now, we're a pawn. And we want to be a kingmaker, if you will. So that means you've got to be more than a pawn. You've got to be a knight and a bishop and, and something else. So my point in, in that speech was that African Americans, if you continue to vote one way, nothing wrong with helping our friends. And, and nothing wrong with opposing our enemies. But as Congressman uh, Bill Clay of Missouri mm -hmm. said when the Congressional Black Caucus was founded, we should not put ourselves in having permanent enemies, permanent friends, but we should always have permanent interests. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is what African Americans should pursue. And if the Democratic Party, as they've been over the many years, our friends, we should reward our friends. If the Republicans have been our enemies, we should oppose them. But with the new uh, election of President-elect Trump, we should say to you, here's a chance. Show us what you said on the campaign trail. You said we have nothing to lose. Well, as I said earlier, work with us and tell us what we have to gain. And we can reward that relation to our special interests with our votes. Because the most important and powerful asset that Americans have in a democracy is a vote. You know, historically, if you look at history f throughout the ages, the only way you change things is either through ballots or bullets. We're not going to change things in this country through bullets. So we got to change things through the ballot. And that's why I believe that uh, African Americans should take the power of that ballot and make other people compete for it, not give it away without asking for something specific, concrete, and return in terms of policies that benefit the African-American voter. Okay, I know we just have a little bit more time left. Uh, transitioning to a new government has to be a, a monumentally difficult task. You've heard some of the things that have been said about the Trump transition so far. Should we take those reports seriously, considering the magnitude of, of, of the work, how difficult it is? I know you've been on the front lines of it yeah, before. Transitions are demanding. You only have about 80 days or less between the time you're elected to get a government <clears throat> in place and raise your right hand to be sworn in. In our case with President Clinton, Republicans had occupied the White House for 12 years. That's a pretty daunting task. You've got a lot of stakeholders. You've got to get a government in place. You've got to choose a White House staff, a cabinet. You've got to step on the world stage. You've got to meet the Washington press and more broadly. Uh, you've got to remember those that helped you get elected and then reach out to those who didn't support you and see if you can uh, get, a, get a, broaden your base. So it's a lot to do in a very short period of time. Uh, I think transitions have changed, Chris, from 1992. I think the big change is 9-11. Uh, I think now it used to be you couldn't start on transitions early because you'd be accused of measuring the drapes and no one wants to look arrogant. Governor Clinton at that time was very aware of that. But after 9-11, I think it's expected, in fact, demanded that you go ahead and begin that transition process. I think where the Trump Organization has a challenge is they began that process with Governor Christie, and then they abruptly changed it with Vice President Pence. So I think they're playing catch-up. But it looks like to me, with 
what's going on now. They're beginning to get caught up and get on track. I hope they are, but it's a lot to do. Very demanding. That first 100 days, very critical. It was essential to President Clinton to get our economic deficit reduction plan in place, and we, we were able to do that, and that really provided the foundation for his presidency. Donald Trump has the same type challenge. Okay. Uh, we'll have a businessman in the White House. I have three businessmen here, so let me go down the line. For the next four years, are you optimistic or, or pessimistic about America? Cautiously, cautiously optimistic. <laughs> As an entrepreneur, you live your life optimistically, <laughs> else you never get to where you're going. So, yeah, I'm optimistic. <laughs> well, first of all, I think if President-elect Trump picks up on some of the wise words Bob Johnson put forth, uh, I think he, that, that'd be good counsel for him to take. I, I'll, I'll go along with all that. We need to support the president, our president, and uh, work hard, be accountable. But we're all Americans at the end of the day. The sense of community is absolutely crucial. Okay. Franklin McClarty, Bob Johnson, Mac McClarty, thanks so much. It's thanks, been a pleasure. Chris, our thanks, pleasure. Chris. Thank you.